worship you. Thank you. 
good. You are good. Carry Job, old one. Hallelujah. Father, we magnify you. In the old covenant, right before they went out to battle, they began to sing, for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. And really all they had to do was stand still and see the goodness of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
that he's good because he didn't ha he didn't have to be good he doesn't have to be good but he decided a long time ago to be good to you from the foundations of the world he decided to be good 
Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of light, with whom there's no variableness, no shadow of turning. He is good. His compassions, they fail not. His mercies, they're new every morning. Amen. It is, he's good. He's full of compassion. He's full of tender mercy. He is good. He is good. He is good. Everybody shout, the Lord is good. Greet one another tonight and say hello to somebody. Hallelujah. Greetings on a Wednesday night. Just want to make sure, is there anyone, this is your very first time with us at Cornerstone. You've joined us on a Wednesday night for the first time. If you do me a favor, lift your hand. Let the ushers put a welcome packet in your hand. On the inside, there's a card that says, we want to get to know you. And if you'll fill that out for me, and put that in the offering uh, when it goes by. Sunday morning, come, uh, 9 or 11. We got a special Sunday morning service. Uh, this Sunday, um, the next two Sundays, we're doing special Christmas stuff. Because it's like not very long away, I hear. Are y'all excited about that? I'd love to find all those shoppers Robert was talking about on Sunday morning. All the kind ones, all the excited ones. When I go out, because I don't go out till Christmas Eve, I don't know, they're kind of pushy. So, um, I praise the Lord. Anyway, so, uh, glory to God. Well, um, so this Sunday coming up, we're going to be doing a Christmas message. Uh, lots of good things are happening. Be sure to invite your friends. People will come out for a Christmas message. Maybe they don't even go to church, but you can invite them for a Christmas message, and I believe they'll come. So invite them. There's other special things going on this Sunday. And then the Sunday after that is Christmas Eve. And we have a one-service-only day with donuts at 9 o'clock. And then at 10 o'clock, we have a special Christmas program. It's one of Pastor Rhonda's. So you know it's going to be exciting. And her sidekick, Sandra, is helping her. And so it's going to be awesome. All right? And so let's look at this week's video announcements. Parenting class is taking place in the AIM building. Don't forget to drop your children off up front at the main building and then make your way back to the parenting class. On December 19th, we have a men's ministry. They'll be meeting in the torch room at 6.30. Come fellowship with the men of Cornerstone Word of Life Church. And then on December 21st, our nursing home ministry will be going to minister at the nursing home. Be sure to meet them here in the sanctuary at 9.30 to prepare your hearts to go minister at Madison Manor. As you know, we have a mission trip to Chile in the month of January. In order to help raise funds for this trip, we're having a fundraiser on December 16th at the Casablanca on Highway 72. If you go in and mention the Seawall mission or take a bulletin from service, they'll donate 15% of the proceeds of your order to our trip. We also have individual team member cards to also help finance this trip, so be sure to grab some of those as well. If you have any questions about how all this works, be sure to see someone at our information desk after service. I am Kimberly Pate, and I have been a member of Cornerstone Word of Life for 20 years. And in January of 2017, I went on my first missions trip with the church to the nation of Chile. As I was praying and studying one night, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and told me that when I went to minister in the church I'd been assigned to, to pray for women that had been uh, desiring to have children or had had difficulty. So Sunday comes, I get up and I prepare Sunday morning service and I'm studying and the Holy Ghost gives me a scripture in Philippians where Paul said that he sent Timothy to, was sending Timothy to them because he would obey basically what the Holy Ghost and he wouldn't seek his own to do his own thing, he would do what God said. So I get to church, they turn the service over, <laughs> and my message would fall flat. Every time I would go to my notes, I couldn't, I couldn't preach by the notes. So I just finally said, okay, notes are gone. We're just gonna depend upon what the Holy Ghost has. And the message was truly about God's faithfulness, how big he is, 
uh, exactly what he wanted to do there, what they could believe him for, and it just went right along with where they were in the growth of the church. And so the Lord prompted me to give my testimony about how I had struggled in my body physically before Noah and Zach were born and what we went through as a family. And so I shared my testimony of how my body for a year did not function and how I went to the doctor every single month with no end result that was favorable uh, to the point they were about ready to send me somewhere else because they said they could not help me. And Pastor Mark had prayed for me, commanded that my body operate like it was supposed to. And that was in July of 1999. And I got pregnant in August of 1999 and had Noah in May of 2000. And after that, I was on birth control and I had Zach 14 months later. Uh, and so to us, God had totally fulfilled what we had desired of him. And so I gave my testimony and said, if there's anybody here that wants to come, please come up here. I want to lay hands on you. And the worship leader, Natalie, came. And she came and told me how her and her husband had tried and that she, uh, they had done in vitro something that was not, I don't know if it's common there, but she said, we just decided that that's what we needed to do. She said, we don't know if it's worked. We don't know where we are. We just had it done and we're waiting. And I started to pray for her. I asked the Lord, I said, what do I say now? He told me, he said, you pray and command that her body take hold with what they planted and that she has full-term pregnancy and a healthy baby, healthy mama. And so I did exactly what the Holy Ghost told me to do and prayed for her and she received it. And in ConCon, the first night that we were there, uh, Natalia's sister had set up a little booth of like jewelry like this and she uh, was selling that. So I was looking for something for my daughter Katie and I found a necklace for her and I wanted a bracelet to match. So I was searching and looking and didn't see anything, but then Natalia had a bracelet on her wrist. And I asked her, I said, do you have any more of those? And she said, no. And she said, what do you want it for? Do you want it? And I was like, no, I'm looking for my daughter to match the necklace that I found. She took it off and gave it to me. And she said, you take this and give this to Katie because God sent you here to stand with me and to believe God with me. And I want her to have it and please tell her that I'm sending it. And so I come home and I got home on a Saturday and I was not able to visit with uh, Katie and Jason until the following weekend. And we had talked by phone, but she wanted to hear, you know, all that had gone on there. And so I told her the same story I'm telling right now and shared with her how Natalia gave me uh, the bracelet and I gave it to her. A week later, she calls and said that they wanted to come see us. Then on the Monday, she came and they came for dinner. While I was cooking dinner, she proceeded to give us a gift to let us know that her and Jason were having our grandbaby. And I did not realize until I went back into the kitchen and she came and she followed me and she said, she said, when you gave me the bracelet, I knew it, what it confirmed for me. She said, for a whole year, nothing worked. And it was like putting me right back in my own world of where I lived. I understood that. And when I turned back around to stir dinner, the Holy Ghost said, I sent Timothy because he would not seek his own. Hi everybody, I just wanted to let you all know that on December 24th, we're going to be having our Christmas program. At 9 a.m. we're going to be having a donut social, so come out, get some fellowship, enjoy your friends, have some family over, and then at 10 o'clock we're going to be having our program. It's going to be so much fun for the entire family, so bring everybody you know. We'll see you guys on Christmas Eve. Hallelujah! Isn't he good? For the Lord is good, and his mercy endureth forever. We can't change that, amen? It's set in stone, and we receive it in the name of Jesus, right? So, you know what, tonight I just want to ask you a question. Who are you? Don't answer that because I'm going to help you out. Over the next few weeks, I'm going to be talking to you about being righteous. 
Glory to God. God made us righteous through Jesus Christ, so you are the righteousness of Jesus. Amen. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really going to try and talk you into it. That's what the Lord said to say to you. Can you talk them into their righteousness? And I believe I can. Amen. Because you know what? I know who I am. Glory to God. That's the question. Who are you? Do you know that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Amen. And so, you know, righteousness is one of the chief attributes of God. Righteousness is defined as morally right or justifiable, free from guilt or sin, right standing with God. But I just want to harp on that free from guilt or sin because that's exactly what Jesus did for us. Jesus paid for our righteousness. Amen. Glory to God. So, you know, God's promised blessings are only to the righteous. Did you know that? <laughs> say, that's me. Look at your neighbor and say, that's you too. <laughs> Amen. So when it comes to righteousness, your faith is involved too. You have to believe the word of God, taking God at his very word. And then, you know, one day you believed you needed a savior, that you needed salvation. So you said yes to Jesus. Amen. I know I did. Invited him to come into your life and submitted yourself to his lordship as Savior and Redeemer. So there are benefits to being righteous. And tonight we're going to look at the benefit of being a giver. Glory. We should all be excited about that. Hallelujah. Giving is the nature of God our Father. He's a giver. And he gave first. <laughs> Before, he didn't know if we were going to give back or not. He gave first. We received it first. Hallelujah. So to give means to freely transfer the possession of something to someone or to hand over to. So God gave his son Jesus for our righteousness sake. And in John 3.16 it says that God loved us so much that he gave. You know, we could stop right here and I could just preach off of that. That God gave us his son. But you know what? There's more. <laughs> Next, we're going to look in Romans chapter 8, verse 32 in the New Living Translation. Hallelujah. And it says, since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Do you believe that? You know, God is not a man that he would lie. And he consistently tells us what he's going to do for us, his children. He's our heavenly father. He's going to do it for us. Why? Not because of us, but because of him. You know, he owns everything. And one of my favorite scriptures, sometimes I'll say to my husband or I'll say to someone else, you know, my father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. <laughs> he can get this to me. Praise his name. And so next it, we're going to look in Romans chapter 5 verse 17 out of the New Living Translation as well. And it says, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death. Through this one man, Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, our Lord, our Savior, and our Redeemer, Jesus. That's who made us righteous. Amen. So when we stand and when I ask the question, who are you? You can say, I am the righteousness of God. And that includes everything that righteousness is. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Amen. <laughs> so, you know, the word tells us how to give. So since we're talking about being a giver tonight, I just want to share with you something from the word just lets us know how we're to give. And I think we need to do it God's way. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, and we're going to look in the Amplified uh, Classic Edition, God tells us that he loves a cheerful giver. And so in verse 7 it says, let each one give 
as he has made up his own mind and purpose in his heart, not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion. For God loves, he takes pleasure in, prizes above other things, and is unwilling to abandon or to do without a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver whose heart is in his giving. So I say, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Glory to God. Ha, ha, ha. A prompt to do, joyous giver. Amen. You can be one too. Hallelujah. So you just come on with me. We'll just go in together. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so um, one of the next verses of scripture I wanted to look at comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 10 in the Amplified also. And it says, and God who provides seed for the sower. You give, God gives. You give, God gives. We give, God gives. He provides seed for the sower and bread for eating. will also provide and multiply your resources for sowing and increase the fruits of your righteousness, which manifests itself in active goodness, kindness, and charity. And so I just submit to you tonight that you're righteous because of Jesus. Keep giving because God can use whatever you give to him. And I want you to just say out loud so that you know in your heart and let your neighbor know. Just say, I'm a righteous giver. Glory to God. There's more to come about righteousness next week. I wouldn't miss it if I were you. <laughs> come and hear what God has to say. So, Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for you are good and your mercy endureth forever. We thank you that we are made righteous through the precious gift of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, your only begotten Son that you chose to give just so that you could give to us, make us righteous so that we could have great fellowship, great relationship with you. And so, Lord, I thank you that even as we give tonight, because we are joyous in our giving, you will give back to us good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And you'll raise up men to chase us down, to give into our bosom. We believe that and we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, you happy givers, Pastor Ron is going to come and minister the word to you, so you ready for that? All right, let her, let her come. Well, good evening, everybody. Woohoo! Everybody doing good? Yeah, we're going to survive this Christmas season, aren't we? <laughs> I do. I too want to shop where Robert shops because uh, I applaud his experiences with nice, gentle shoppers. All right. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now in Jesus' name. Ha, ha, ha. Father, I thank you for the word that you've given me this night for these people. I thank you, Father, that you expound teacher, great teacher that you are. I thank you that you divide it to every person severally as they have need of. And I thank you for it, Father. We approach your word with reverence, Father. We'll treat it as it truly is, the very words of the master, the words of our God. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. I believe the Lord has had us on a journey this summer. We started out with authority, went from authority to faith, morphed from faith into love because our faith works by love. Uh, and now tonight I've got some battle-winning strategies for you. Glory to God. All right, so I want us to go back and look at a couple scriptures we read earlier uh, over the last several months, and we're going to jump off of those into something new tonight. So Revelation 12:7 is where we're beginning. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. 
and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Let's go to Isaiah 14, 12. Pick up the story. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Now you have to understand, Satan got lifted up in pride in heaven. He got a little big for his britches, and he decided he was going to be just like God. He could do it as good as God. He, he was going to mount his kingdom above the throne of God, and, and uh, he got into pride, and that pride caused him to get into rebellion, and then he got his backside kicked. And his place was found no more in heaven. Because God has no rival. He has no equal. Glory to God. Woo! Sometimes, you know, we get to thinking the devil, you know, he's, he's the opposite of God, but he's not the opposite because in order to be opposite, they'd have to be equal. And God has no equal. He has no equal. So he said, I'm going to uh, ascend my throne above the throne of God. And God said, out you go. And he got kicked out. Now let's go back to Romans 12 and read a little further than we read the first time. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. I just like to remind the devil. And prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Now listen, regrettably, when Satan was cast out, he came to the earth. Now how many of you know he hates God, Satan hates God, he's depraved and sick, and when he rejected all the goodness that God is, then he was filled with the absence of good and God and love, which is what? Evil and hatred. Right? That's what the enemy is full of. He can no longer directly challenge God since he got kicked out. But the Bible, because the Bible says that God casts out Satan with his finger. And I know I do this a lot, but I want to do it just one more time tonight. Are you ready? You want to know how God gets rid of Satan? Did you see it? It's, the Bible says. God casts out Satan with the finger of God. He didn't even lift his hand. He just gave him a little. But when he got cast out, he came here to the earth. And he began to pick at God's prized creation. Those beings which God loved and created in his own likeness and in his own image, which is us. So, he's down here. How many of you know it's true? Because of that, you know, stuff is going to happen. 
But I got good news, and it's something we've been talking about all summer. He has given us authority in his name to defeat Satan every time Satan rears his ugly head against us. I want to look at Luke 10, 17. We looked at this portion, and then we're going to jump off. This is where we're jumping, okay? Luke 10, 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. But behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. All the power. He has given us authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions. And he's given us authority and power over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Listen, he has given us authority in his name to defeat Satan every time he rears his ugly head against us. And that's what we've been talking about all summer long. Stuff happens. How many of you know stuff happens? If you're alive in the earth, you're going to have adversity. I am so grateful that as children of the Most High God, blood-bought, washed in the blood of the Lamb, given authority and power, given His name, given the authority to use that name. We talked one night about the difference between authority and power. He's not only given us the power, He gave us the authority to use it. But life happens. Stuff happens. We live in a fallen world where the devil is down here trying to pick every chance he gets. How many of you know it's true? I'm so grateful that we're not like mere human beings without him. I wouldn't want to be without him in this world. My stars, how do they do it? Because sorrow and tragedy and adversity and heartache comes to everybody who lives in this fallen world. But when adversity comes to you, and it will, the first thing we need to do is go to God and get his strategy to overcome the adversity and win. How many of you know that none of this that you're going through is a surprise to God? He knows your future better than you know your past. Listen to me. He's got a way of escape already made for you. He's got a way out already made for you. It's just up to you to figure out what that is, to go before him and get the plan of God. He has a plan. You just got to go get it. You know, Pastor alluded to the story in Second Chronicles. We use it a lot. And, and I, uh, I know you're pretty familiar with it, but I, I want to give it just real quick and make a point, all right? Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other besides the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then came them, then came, then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be uh, by Hazan Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared. How many of you know these are men of war? They know how to fight. And he knew he was outnumbered. He knew he was in trouble. I tell you, when your leader's afraid, that's a problem. So Jehoshaphat feared, but then what did he do? He set himself to seek the Lord. How many of you know when you're in trouble, that's what you got to do? Well, you ought to be doing it every day. But especially when the enemy rears his ugly head. Jehoshaphat set himself to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And gathered themselves to, and Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. How many of you know that's a good thing to do when stuff happens, when adversity comes? 
So, and verse, uh, let's skip down to verse 12 for time's sake. This is them talking to the Lord. O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Lord, I, I tell you, when you don't know what to do, lift your eyes to the one who does. Because he does know what you need to do to win. If you don't know what to do, don't fret. Ask the one who does. Are, are you with me? Our eyes are upon thee. Verse 13. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye, all Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but it's God's. Whew, glory to God. Glory to God. I could do a Jericho march, but I won't. Tomorrow, what is this? This is the plan. Tomorrow, go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You shall not need to fight in this battle. How many of you know that's good news? We're talking about hand-to-hand -hand combat with swords and spears and chopping to death and body parts flying and na nasty stuff. He said, you're not going to have to do that. Glory to God. Woo! That was good news. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves. Stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Verse 21, for time's sake. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. They put the singers up front. The unarmed singers before the army to march out against the enemy. Dear Lord, that's one time I probably wouldn't have wanted to be in the choir. And they said, praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. So when they came over the top of the hill that day, they were all laying dead before them. Every one of the enemies, they turned on themselves and they began to fight each other. And by the time Israel even got there, it was all over with. What started them doing that when they began to praise? And sing praises to God. Why? How could they do that? Because they believed God. I want us to analyze this situation. Guys, go ahead and put my, my uh, slide up there. The adversity came. In this case, it came in, in the form of three armies and more people who had come against Jehoshaphat and the children uh, of God. So the adversity came. Then what did they do? They sought God. With all their heart, they sought God because they knew this was too much for them. And when they sought God, what happened? He spoke. He told them what to do. After he spoke, they had to choose to believe what he said. 
How many of you know they could have said, Lord, we can't do that. I can't fight them. They're too much. No, he said, I got this. You won't even have to fight. Just go on down. They had to believe what he said. We talked about this earlier this summer, but belief is a choice. When you hear from the word of God or when God speaks to your heart and mind something, you decide whether or not you're going to believe that. Based on the integrity and your experience with the speaker. How many of you know he is not a man that he should lie? (laughs) Neither the son of man that he should change his mind. Glory to God. So he spoke when they sought him and they believed what he said. Then they acted on what God said. And when those last four things happened, when they sought God, when he spoke, when they believed what he said, and when they acted on what he said, then God was able to to bring to pass a great victory. Do you see a pattern in there? There's a pattern in there for us. What kind of a battle strategy is that to send unarmed worshipers out ahead of the army? I guarantee you, you will not find that strategy in any military strategy book, past, present, or future. How many of you know in the natural that made no sense? How can we go out to meet them tomorrow and not have to fight? That doesn't make sense. Look, they're coming to kill us. But God had a plan. And when they asked him for it, he gave it to them. When he spoke, they had to believe, and they had to obey. And when they did, God was able to bring to pass a great victory. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. It came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag, that was their city, and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captive that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and daughters were taken captives. How many of you know he now had adversity? Something terrible had happened. You know, we can be kind of casual about this because it's not our stuff. It's not our children. It's not our spouses that have been carried off into bondage. But this was very real, and this was very serious. And the Bible says these great men of war cried till there was no more strength within them to cry. Then David's mighty men, the Bible says, spoke of stoning him. They turned on David because every one of them was grieved for their families, grieved for their wives and their children. But the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. Let's skip on down for time's sake to verse 8. And David inquired at the Lord saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. So what happened? The adversity came. David began to seek the Lord. As he sought the Lord, the Lord spoke. The Lord told him what to do. Now David has to do what? Believe it and act on it. Did he? He did. Skip down to verse 16. And when he, the little spy they caught in the desert that the troops had left behind, When he had brought him, David, down to where they were hiding or where they lived, the people who had taken all their stuff, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David, with 400 men, smote them from the twilight even until the evening of the next day, And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon the camels and fled. And David, 400 against God knows how many. 400 got away. And it took him a day and a half to kill the rest. That's a lot of folk. How many of you know David was outnumbered? But did what? And 
okay, y'all, when, when David and his mighty men got back to Ziklag, they were tired. Then everything was gone, and they wept till they had no more strength within them to weep. So now they're not only physically drained, they're emotionally drained. Uh, 600 men set out with David to, to, to chase, and when they came to some creek, uh, 200 of the 600 said, we're just too exhausted. These are David's mighty men. These are great men of war. 200 of the 600 said, we're too tired. We, we can't physically do it. We can't do it. So he left them there with the stuff. And he took 400, came down upon those multitude of men and killed them all for a day and a half. 400 got away. How many more did they slay? We don't know, but it was a whole bunch of folk. It took them a day and a half for 400 men to kill maybe thousands. But you know what? They did it. They did it. Verse 18. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. Verse 19. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil, nor anything that they had taken to them, for David recovered all. So let's analyze what happened. Guys, put my, put my slide back up there. The adversity came. They came home and, you know, the, the enemy had taken all their stuff and their families. What did they do then? They sought God. David sought God. And when David sought God, God spoke. Now David believed what he said. He did or he wouldn't have gone after them. Even in his exhausted state, he believed God could get him there and get him through the battle. And how many of you know he did? Whoo! David had to believe what God said. Then David had to act on what God said to go after them. And when he acted on what God said, God was able to, to bring about a great victory. How many of you know the steps were the same? Those, those six steps were the same, but the strategy from the Lord was different. In the first account we looked at, Jehoshaphat didn't have to fight in the battle. As they began to worship, the Lord supernaturally intervened, and they didn't even have to fight. How many of you know I like those kind of battles? Selah, wish they were all that way. Jehoshaphat did. And send out the singers first. Well, if it worked for Jehoshaphat, how many of you know they'd be dead singers all over the ground? They're going to have to get a new choir because the singers would have all been dead. That's not how God told him to do it. What is my point? God may have different strategies for each person and each battle, even if the attack and the circumstances look the same. Listen, just because brother so-and-so won a battle this way doesn't mean that's God's strategy for you. There is no shortcut for you getting on your face before God. And asking him, Lord, what shall I do? How shall I win this battle? Are you with me? You know, uh, it's, it's people, it's easier to let somebody else do your thinking and praying than for you to have to get down on your own face before God and hear for your own self. Even preachers do it. You know, they hold all these seminars. You know, I can teach you how to grow your church like I grew mine. How many of you know that was their plan for their city based upon their gifts and their people and their city? And for every, You know, I, I heard, I, I love Patty Dunnick. She's a little sassy. She, she's a little bit like me. She's strong and she's sassy. 
And so she was talking to a pastor's wife, and the pastor's wife was like, I've been to these conferences, and, you know, just, you know, when they're, they told us how to do it like that, and, you know, it didn't work, and we went to this conference, and, you know, and then our church isn't growing, and they, you know, went to, and she's like, I live on a little island in the middle of the sea. I don't have any conferences to go to. You want to know how I grew my church? I got on my face until God spoke to me and told me what to do. She has a church of hundreds in a little tiny island in the middle of the South Pacific because God told her what to do when she got on her face. How many of you know it's just so much easier for us, though? Tell me what worked for you. You know, one of the things next week is, I'm using a lot of Old Testament examples tonight to make my point. Next week, we're going to turn it into the New Testament for us. What does this look like in the New Covenant? Because the strategy may not be the same for any one individual. God has a way to bring you out victoriously without even the smell of smoke on your clothes. You know, I love that about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they threw them in that fiery furnace, the guys who threw them in were killed. It was so hot. When the king looked in, he said, what do you see? He said, didn't we throw in three? He said, I see four men in there. And one of them looks like the Son of God. Finally, they had to open the door and let him out because they were not being consumed. The Bible says God brought them out without even the smell of smoke on their clothes. I love that. I mean, how many of you know that is no harm at all? You don't even stink when you get out of a fire. That's pretty good. We were in an apartment building that burned down one time, and trust me, smoke stinks. Even just being around it causes everything to stink. But God brought them out without even the smell of smoke on their clothes. I love that about God. Everybody has, however, their own strategy. They have to get from God on their own to know how to win in your particular battle. There's no shortcut around it. I want us to look at yet another instance from the Old Covenant. Joshua 6.1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. I'm using stories we even used yet this summer because you're familiar with them. I don't have to read the whole thing. Israel, uh, Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. I mean, the doors were shut tight. The soldiers were on the walls. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. We talked about that just recently. It looked like anything but what God said. The city was tightly shut up. These were giant walls here. They were so wide that they had chariot races on top. This was a formidable fortress. And it was shut up tight with men ready for battle with their boiling oil and with their spears and with their bows and arrows and with their swords. They were waiting at the top. And God said, see, I've given into your hand, Jericho. You ever, you ever had the Lord say stuff like that to you? Look, you, you, you won. It don't look like I'm winning. It doesn't feel like I'm winning. You got this. Now, the question becomes, do, do you believe? Verse 3. You shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days, every day for six days. I want you to walk around the city saying nothing. Verse 4. 
And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. So for six days you're going to walk around the wall one time, not saying a word. On the seventh day you're going to walk around seven times, not saying a word. What kind of a battle strategy is that? Seriously. Reminds me of the Veggie Tales. The little French peas were up on top of the wall, throwing slushies down at God's people. And they sang them a song Keep walking, but you won't knock down our walls. Keep walking, but she isn't going to fall. It's plain to see that your brains are very small. If you think walking, we'll be knocking down our walls. How many of you know that is not a very good battle strategy? I'm, we're just going to walk, not say anything, for seven days. We're just walking. We're not fighting. We're, we're not. Do you know how much discipline that took? These are men who wanted to get in there. These are men who wanted to use the swords they had strapped to their waist. You know they were hurling insults at them. You know how men do? I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. Come on. Bring it on, big boys, you know, or whatever. You know how men are. You know they were saying terrible things. And they just shut their mouth and walked. You ever had the devil scream at you while you're obeying God and walking through something? I'm going to kill you. I'm killing you. I'm going to take you out. What do you think? You're believing God is changing anything. You think your pithy little prayers are making any difference. Do you see any difference? You know it's true. Even by the standards of that day, that was an unorthodox battle strategy. If you just did that in the natural and not by the direction of God, what would happen? Nothing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Joshua 6.20. So, this is after the seventh time on the seventh day. So the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. You couldn't do that, though, in the natural, without the direction of God, and it produce anything. My point is this. It's not in the physical activity that the power is. The power is in the obedience to the words that God spoke. Are you hearing me? The power is in the obedience to the words God spoke when he speaks and we believe him. Our faith activates that power that's inherent in his words and directs that power to the problem at hand with supernatural results. Luke 1, 37, out of the Amplified Classic. I love this verse of Scripture. For with God, nothing is ever impossible. And no word from God shall be without power. Let's just stop there. No word from God is ever without power. The words in this book, this is not a natural book. This is not a natural book. And it's not that, oh, the pages are holy. I, I, had, I, had, I had a friend who was very superstitious, and she was like, oh, 
you don't stick anything in your Bible because <gasps> there's power in the book. How, how many of you know it's a book? Are, are you with me? The paper pages have no more power than the paper pages uh, of any other book with ink written on them. Where the power is, is when we read and believe. When we hear God speak and we believe, then the power is here. It's not a, ooh. Our faith activates the power. His words are like containers that contain the power to bring to pass whatever he said. The power to bring it to pass is already in the words. And so when you receive those words, then you can say like Jeremiah, thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I have been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. When you believe his words and you receive them and you eat them and you take them down deeply inside of you, they nourish your mortal flesh. And when you add your faith with it, those words release their power to bring to pass what he said. You may not be able to win your battle with the same strategy God gave someone else to win their battle. You need to seek his advice, his wisdom in every single battle you're facing. Because when God speaks, his words have the power already in them to bring to pass whatever he said to you. But in order to activate that power, you have to believe what he said. And if he gave you something to do, then do it. Sometimes even the same person can't win the same battle the same way twice. On over in Joshua 8. Remember Joshua just walked around the walls? One time a day for seven, for six days. On the seventh day they walked seven. The walls fell. They marched right in, got what they needed and wanted. Over here in Joshua 8, same man, same army, same people, same situation. They were facing another enemy. Another city they had to take. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Joshua, fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given in. I love that. See? How many of you know ain't nothing happened yet? Ain't nothing to see. See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. And thou shalt do to I and her king as thou didst unto Jericho and her king. How many of you know he could have stopped right there and jumped ahead? He said, we're supposed to do the same thing we did to Jericho. So we're going to march. Everybody get ready. We're marching around. Six days, one time on the sixth day, on the seventh day, we're doing seven times. We're going to shout. We're, we're going to, the priests are going to blow the trumpet. And God's going to give us the city, only it wasn't the same plan. Don't get ahead of God. Get the plan. Get the plan. He meant you're going to kick their butt just like you did Jericho's. Well, Pastor Rhonda, that's not very nice. No, it probably isn't but it's true. That's what he meant. And he said, Thou shalt do to I, I and her king as thou didst unto Jericho and her king. Only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall ye take for a prey unto yourselves. Lay thee an ambush for the city behind it. He went on to lay out a strategy where part of the army, most of the army would hide out near the city, but they would hide, and a little bit of the army would come up to the, to the city walls, and, uh, and, and when the guys started chasing them, they would start running away and hopefully draw the soldiers, and they did draw the soldiers away from the city, chasing the, the uh, people of God. And then when all the soldiers had left the city, then those who were hiding came and took the city. 
How many of you know that's a different strategy? That's a different plan. Though it was the same situation with the same men and the same army. What am I saying? Don't just assume because you want to battle this way this time, God's going to do it exactly that way next time. There is no shortcut for you getting on your face and getting the plan of God. Sometimes if we have a great victory, we want to repeat the same actions the next time we get in a similar battle because if it worked the first time, surely it'll work the second. How many of you ever watched uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? I forget in which, in, uh, in one movie they, they won a great battle. And in the second movie, I think it was, uh, anyway, the guys, the, the two uh, humans who were the sons of God, they got impatient. They had asked God for his direction, and they weren't getting it fast enough. So they decided what worked last time will work this time. So they went and, and tried to overtake the city, and they were terribly beaten back by the enemy because they didn't wait for the plan. Are you with me? Well, it's not happening fast enough. Well, hold your horses, man. God is not in a hurry. He's always right on time. He's always right on time. He's never late, but he oftentimes isn't there the second we want him to. How, how many of you know what I mean? There have been times I've gone to God and I said, just get me out of here. Now, do something now. God said, keep walking. Keep confessing. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm bringing you out. Not fast enough. Do something. Sometimes it is what it is. God has a plan. He's arranging people. He's working on your behalf. He's doing things in the background. Whether it happens as fast as you want it or not is irrelevant. God is at work to bring to pass his word. If you'll keep believing and you'll keep acting, he'll keep working. Exodus 17.1, this is another example. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandments of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, and there there was no water for the people to drink. How many of you know being in the desert with no water is a problem? And the people weren't born again anyway, and they were good and cranky. Verse 2, wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Where is this, that, that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And, Mer and Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river. Take in thine hand and go. Behold, I stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall water come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. How many of you know he, God said, take your rod, the one that you hit the waters with and they parted when you crossed the Red Sea. Take that same rod and go hit that rock. What? They're in the middle of the desert. What good is it going to do to hit a rock? How many of you know you don't have to understand? Because really, the power isn't in the physical action anyway. It's in the words of God. And your obedience and your faith activate that power. So Moses took the rod and he hit the rock and water gushed out. And they had all the water they needed while they were there. But how many of you know a little while later it happened again? Numbers 20 verse 1. 
Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. For time's sake, I'm going to skip their whining. But they whine for the next three verses. But why you bring us out here? You just brought us out here to kill us. I know you. You know, what are you? Anyway, they whine for three verses. Verse 6. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and get the same rod he hit the rock with, the same rod who parted the Red Sea. Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. How many of you know that's a different strategy? And it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. How many of you know the first time they needed water, Moses went through our steps. Guys, put them up there again. The adversity came. They had no water. What did they do? They sought God. When they sought God, he spoke. The first time he said, hit a rock. They believed what he said or else they wouldn't have done it. They acted on what God said. He took that staff and he whacked that rock. And when, the, when they did, water gushed forth. The answer came. Are you with me? The second time, the adversity came. No water again. They sought God. When they sought him, God spoke. They sort of believed what he said. But how many of you know they didn't act on it the second time? Verse 6. Oh, I didn't write it down. What happened, I don't know how far down it is. Um, what happened, what had happened was, <laughs> what had happened was, <laughs> we can read it here in numbers. I don't know how far down it is. Uh, so we, uh, let's go. We'll, we'll try to find it. Numbers 29, 20 verse 9. I know I'm throwing him a curveball upstairs because I don't have it in my notes. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him, verse 10. And Moses gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear you now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Verse 11. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he... Whoa, what did God tell him to do? But what did he do? We know from our perspective, why the direction changed. The direction came because the rock was a type of Christ. Christ had to be struck to bring forth living water that would save the people alive. But after the first striking, when he was struck down, he only had to be struck down once. After that, the living water comes forth, voice and faith activated. Voice and faith activated. That was the picture he was trying to give us that Moses messed up because he got afraid when he was standing there in front of everybody. He had to have been saying to himself, listen, I know if I hit it, it'll work, but I don't know about the speaking thing. I'm going to look like a fool if I speak and nothing happens. So he said, I'm going to lean back on what I know. I'm going to lean back on what worked last time. And he took the, the staff and he beat the rock twice. But how many of you know it messed up the picture that God was trying to give us? That the rock only had to be struck once to bring forth its living water. And after that, the things of God, our faith and voice activated now listen, God had mercy on the people and allowed the rock to bring forth water for the second time. 
But he told Moses, because you didn't do it the way I said, you're going to go to the promised land and you're going to see it from afar. But even though you led these people these 40 years, you're not going to be able to go in and partake because he disobeyed God. The rock wasn't the issue. His obedience, his belief, his faith were the issue. And my point is this. God has a specific way for you to win each battle that comes your way. Yes, it's based upon the word. And we're going to talk about this as New Testament believers next week. We're going to get into it. How do we as New Testament believers win every battle the devil throws at us? How do we win? But listen, my point to you is sometimes there are specific instructions for what God tells you to do. For that situation at that moment. And there is no shortcut for you going through these steps. Guys, put them up there one last time. When a problem comes, when adversity comes into your life, what happens? Number two, you got to seek God. You got to seek God. Number three, when you seek Him, He's going to speak. Because He said, if you'll call on Him, He will answer you. And because of the word He's given us, He's already answered a lot of it. Number four. When he speaks, when we find his words on the subject, then we must believe what he said. If he gives us something to do, then we have to act on what God said. And when those things happen, then God can wrought a great victory for us. Amen? But my point to you tonight is this. Not everybody's strategy is the same. There is no shortcut for you seeking God on your own. No shortcut for you getting on your knees when adversity comes to your house, when adversity comes to you, and you getting the plan of God for your situation now in this moment. And my point to you is this. Just because something worked for somebody else doesn't mean it's your plan. God may want to do something totally different for you. And just because you want a victory one way, one time, doesn't mean that's how he wants you to do it the next. We need to be asking. We need to be seeking. We need to be following these steps so we can win every time. Amen? Next week we're going to take it down to street level where we live. We're going to talk about you getting the plan for your adversity. Amen? All right. Do you have anything? All right. You're dismissed.